Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on iDadio. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and I'm your host of the series. Um, and in this weekly show, I'm chatting with weekly guests, people who inspire me, people who are really taking risks in the classical music world, and chatting with them about um, what drives them and what helps them push boundaries. Today, I'm so thrilled to be joined by internationally acclaimed mezzo-soprano and, ironically, one of my uh, best friends, um, mezzo-soprano Mireille Lebel. Her international solo career takes her from singing leading opera roles at the Boston Early Music Festival, Aix-en-Provence, the uh, Prague State Opera, Teatro San Carlo, Vancouver Opera, Columbus Opera, Theater Erfurt, um, Opera de Metz, a specialist in early music and Baroque, she regularly collaborates with the Les Violons du Roi, uh, with Tafel Music and B-Rock Orchestra in London. And she also appears as a guest with the Houston Symphony Orchestra, the Kansas Symphony Orchestra, with festivals like Festival de la Nantière with uh, Yannick Nézé-Séguin and the Schleswig-Holstein Festival with Christoph Eschenbach. Um, so I'm really, really thrilled to welcome today Mireille Lebel. Welcome Mireille. Thanks. Hi, Rachel. Hi. <laughs> How are you? It's so nice to have you on the show. It's so thank you for asking me. It's really fun to be here. I mean, I'm hoping it will be fun. As we <laughs> <continue>. <laughs> um, I love to begin by just hearing and hearing what your your first musical memories are and whether there was a specific musical moment that sort of led you um, down down your path that you're on now. Do you know what? I actually, I in a way came to music pretty late, like, which is, I mean, it's funny to say that because I actually started my parents, um, it was very important for them that I'd be involved in music. So they put me in piano lessons very young. And I mean, I, I really loved piano, but I wouldn't say that I had any special like connection to the instrument. I was musical and like I would move around a lot like this when I played. So everyone told my parents like she's very musical, you know, and my parents were like, really? Because she looks pretty weird. But anyway, it was it was something that um, I did, but I didn't feel a very strong connection to music. I think what appealed to me more and the first time I was really enthralled with something was actually seeing someone on stage. This to me was like the most exciting and amazing thing and that got me dreaming so I'd say like music itself started touching me I'd say like when I maybe at 18 when I went away to music university and I started listening to things and it wasn't really opera that excited me musically it was actually early music and a lot of choral music and then I really started to feel um, passion and there's you know as I get older there's steps Every year I discover something. I discovered the opera Don Carlo by Verdi. It, I had a viscerally excited reaction to it. It was so incredible. So it's a bit of, of a build with music. Mm. That's oh, cool. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, what I think is like particularly unique about, about your path is that um, you sort of went, you began in a more traditional way. Um, you did, you know, your young artist programs um, as an opera singer and then went to a theater and took a bus contract and did that for five years. And then you sort of took this move to become a freelancer, um, which I find like a really bold move. And I was, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about that and how that felt for you. Did it feel like a huge risk at the time when you, when you took that? I mean, it's not, I think it's, it's very courageous, I would say, to, to choose to leave the theater a fest regular kind of contract and go into freelance and which you do you did so successfully um building such a such an international career so wondering if you could just talk about that a little bit sure yeah um i think because uh i studied music in north america and in a way i didn't really have an eye on europe i didn't really ever plan my career in any organized way and it was a great luck that I got the job in Fest. I didn't even really know how lucky I was until I got to the Fest and then realized, oh, wow, you know, you get to sing, basically go through of the bulk of the repertory and be in a, in a safe, a relatively safe space because I was in a house that was not so much pressure, maybe, maybe medium pressure. And that, of course, you, you have to deliver, but people weren't necessarily coming to hear things. So if you have an off night, which everyone has anyway, but it was more okay, you know, especially as, as I was learning. And in my head, the fest 
uh, situation would always end because as my North American background, I never expected to be in such a situation in the first place. So the fact that I had it was a bonus. And it was also probably naive to think that, to think that I could just leave, um, but I did. And it wasn't any kind of dramatic move for me. Mm -hmm. I think the only reason I survived it, because definitely what could have happened is a year later been like, oh shit, I better find another fast contract stat, which is in any case, not so easy. But um, I had eggs in a lot of different baskets. And I think that's what saved me because I had, it took a very long time for my voice to develop. So I had a lot of, built a lot of um, context in early music and also in new music. Um, but somehow the early music ended up taking over more. And then I only actually sang, you know, real repertoire when I moved to Germany. So then kind of that door slowly opened up. But um, I would say if I didn't have those eggs in, several countries and in different styles, it would have, it would have been a risky move. And again, yeah. like, I didn't think that I wasn't like, oh, I've got my eggs in my baskets. I'm all set. I was like, oh, I guess I'm out of my fest now. You know, it was just to kind of, yeah, play it by ear. Yes. Yeah. That's no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, it's still, it's still a risk, of course. I mean, that it's still, yeah. I think a very big thing that you did, but um, it makes sense. And it, it's good that you talk about the ensembles because that's that's something I also wanted to talk to you about is, is a lot of those like regular collaborations that you have. And just wondering um, how those have grown for you and how they've evolved. And one thing I'm particularly curious about for you um, is that you have this passion for opera, but you also have this passion for, for, these, um, for chamber music, for these ensemble pieces, for specializing and yeah. I wanted to ask specifically, what do those different things offer you artistically? Mm. So like, what, what does opera give you that mm -hmm. maybe? So opera, I mean, especially in the past um, like five or six years, when I was able to start revisiting like relationships I built with certain directors and, and so I got basically it was that the first the first one I mean often it goes well which is why you you would be someone would want to collaborate and you would want to collaborate with someone else but just the like knowing how they're going to work knowing how you're going to work and then being comfortable and be able being able to go in really any direction. I don't, I don't mean necessarily going for risks. I just mean being able to turn on a dime to change it for someone to say a small comment, but you know exactly what they mean. I mean, mm -hmm. the deepening relationships have been really incredible. And then you really feel like you have like your artistic bread and butter, you know, that feels great. And opera, I think if I was arriving on a stage where I didn't know hardly where I didn't really know anybody and it was a pre-planned production. Of course, this is great. And you have to do this because it's a business and, you know, you need to do those, your five, you know, top roles in places that perhaps you don't know anyone, but that is like what you do for the business and to make your career further and what you actually do and where you can really do interesting things also for the public. I think that's important too. It's not just yourself. It's for the people seeing it will feel a different feeling. That's that kind of relationship where you, you grow and develop and operas are just such complicated things with such moving parts that um, it's amazing when you can take the time and already skip a lot of the things that, you know, you have to build in the beginning, you're already at a certain level. So that's what I like in opera. And then in chamber music, well, then that's when, I mean, I'm not going to say the op, the music is not important for me in opera, because of course it is. And maybe when I'm, you know, 55 or 60, I'll, I'll have a night where I feel like I did as well musically as dramatically and everything lined up. But in chamber music, you can concentrate more on yeah. the music and also the small scale, being able to rehearse when you want and when you need, not being part of a big cog and an opera machine, which is so complicated to schedule rehearsals and everything. With chamber music, it's just so much more flexible and uh, you can just enjoy so much the collaboration. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what, I, I, I want to talk to you about inspiration. I mean, what, who are, the, who are your biggest inspirations? Like, who do you turn to, to, to feel inspired? I, and, sorry. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> I got really excited about that question. Yes. No, no, I, I finished. Okay. Um, so I, I think that um, my inspirations are uh, usually 
very often um, early music going everything from a solo singer that I love. And there's so many, so many singers that I absolutely love that, that are working right now. Also singers from the past, but many that are working right now. And uh, also anything with uh, any early music with big choir, it just gets me to the heart. And that just ins basically that gives me energy and, and, you know, I guess, hep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Use my gran grandfather's favorite expression. And then also I'm extremely inspired by um, actors and actresses and certain filmmakers and the style that they present and people's Instagrams account. You know, some very art design people, they really grab my attention and I actually want to live in, of course, that's how it's designed, their Instagram world that they create. Like I really want to move there. And there's just, I mean, there really are a lot of things. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, those, those are three of the big ones, like visual design homes yeah. yeah architecture maybe more because picturing the people or the life you would have if you live there picturing what goes on mm -hmm. the whole story these things really inspire me and then do you feel like you can take that into your work I mean do you oh, even yeah. know how that goes into your work? um well actors and actresses are are easy obviously someone will inspire me a character they're playing um this television program killing eve Jodie Comer, who plays Villanelle, was just so delightfully unhinged. And I was doing a kind of complicated production of Carmen and it needed to be something special. And I just channeled this, what would Villanelle do? I mean, it's as simple as that really. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And um, it, so, I mean, it can be that direct. I don't know if I'm really inspired by a mood or an era or a certain style of architecture, maybe picturing myself there and then bringing that into something you bring. This is more for on stage. Right. For music, I don't know, maybe it's more of an internal thing, like, yeah, the state of mind you're in, so. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and do you feel like you you need that, that constant inspiration to fuel your creativity? I mean, you're a very creative person. I mean, I know that because I'm, I'm a good friend, <laughs> but. Um, you're just a highly creative person. And so, yeah, I mean, what kind of role do you feel like inspiration plays for you in your in I would say that I'm, I'm an easy sell and that there's a lot of things that inspire me. Mm. Um, and I think it's, I think it's crucial. But yeah. just to say that it's not like I'll go, you know, 60 days or even necessarily two days without finding something that inspires me. I'm very receptive to all these things. So I'd say it plays an extremely important part and I would, I need it in order to, um, to put something special into what I do, but that I'm super, super, super receptive. So, hmm. you know, I know it's going to come no matter, no matter what, basically. Yeah. yeah. But I need it. So if it didn't come, yeah, I just <laughs> stay, on, stay on my couch. I don't know. <laughs> Not leave the house. Yeah. Do you, do you ever think about what, I mean, it's that tricky question um, as musicians, because it's like we very rarely step out of what we're doing and look at what we're doing. But do you think about what your role is as a singer or what your role is as a performer? Um, what do you feel like kind of drives you and what your sort of main drive is or message? I guess what oh, my role, I feel that um, when people go and see the opera or go to watch live music being performed, um, there's so much they can get out of it. You know, obviously, first of all, is just being out with people you know, having the energy of other people around you, knowing something incredible is gonna happen that is, or not incredible, which is also okay, but that you guys experience together. I think subconsciously that's that's a big a big thing. But then when, when you see someone on stage, um, I think that what I would like or what my role is, <laughs> my role is that if somebody is watching something that I do, that either, there's something that I do that they see themselves, like they see themselves in something that I do. And then they feel a connection and they feel like, oh, there's someone in, in this world who's kind of part of my tribe or who kind of understands me, or they see themselves in that 
it gives them a warm feeling, like a happy feeling, or that I do something that, you know what I mean? I just, I guess my role is to make, <laughs> would be, I would, or I would appreciate or be happy if people felt like either, like it confirms what they think about themselves and mm -hmm. makes them feel stronger in themselves mm -hmm. or would challenge something. And by challenge, I mean, I'm not making any kind of political statements. I'm an interpreter. But if something that I'm interpreting gives them a very violent no feeling, that also is an interesting thing for them to, to ask why, you know? So I guess this would be it. I, I just really hope for some, that people would have, feel a connection, you know? And it would bring them down a number of paths. It does not have to be a positive path. It can be a negative path. I think that's also important. Yeah. I love that. I really love that. This idea of connecting and this idea of identifying in a way with what you're experiencing as well. That's super interesting. Um, you say no political message, but do you ever, is that ever anything you think about as really an nice. artist? No. I mean, I, I recognize that it is important and it is not maybe a very popular thing to say. And many people believe why should art exist otherwise? I'm not, you know, I feel it's more than reading the daily paper. I don't step into this sphere, you know, and of course I have my opinions, but I think it's, it's more important in what I do to basically what I said about my role, you know, to try to form some connection, something that's so that's ultra real, real and speak to someone. So yeah. political, I mean, maybe my thoughts would change. Maybe if I'd had a, a difficult upbringing or something, I would feel very strongly that this was my way of being heard and, and being spoke to. And I think that's, I'm very admiring artists who are like this. Um, but for me, it's not not yet been a thing. Yeah, yeah. And who knows what will happen? I don't know. Yeah. No, it's it's such a, also a good point about it's kind of where you come from as well, and it's it's a, it's not just about um, yeah, it's about when you enter that sphere. I think that's such a great way of putting it. it um, if you're only entering it with your daily paper in the morning, then yeah, yeah. I don't I don't necessarily have something that I'm that angry about yet you know right <laughs> yeah right right but who, um, knows? <laughs> who knows yeah well and of course I mean as an opera singer you're part of productions which are sometimes political and like that's yes yeah, yeah. absolutely but yes. no I it's some it's something it's always interesting to hear that from people because I think it we're all so different in this way of what Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, for people, it's of primary importance, and that's what, what <laughs> justifies the existence of art, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what's one of the biggest obstacles you've had to overcome artistically? I guess imposter syndrome is one of them. Is that kind of what, does that fall into artistic or? <laughs> that, I don't know. Artistic, well. Okay, maybe this would be more it. It's that in what we do, there's just as interpreters interpreting the same, you know, major 25 operas with a bit around the, per, you know, a bit of exciting new things around the periphery. It's really, um, I think, finding for your own self why you, why you're standing on the stage and why you should be allowed to stand on the stage. And, and, um, I think already getting up to the stage for anyone who does it is, is quite something. I'm not saying that you need to justify your existence or being on the stage, but I think it's, it's very intimidating um, in a way that like dancers don't have and actors don't have because they have so, such a, a steady influx of new repertoire. It's so expensive to commission a new opera and it doesn't happen that often. If you're lucky enough to do it, I think the freedom you artistic freedom you feel is just, I mean, it's a gift. But how often do we get such a gift, you know? So then you're singing a role that's 150 mezzos did before you better and maybe 15 are doing in the world right now. And, you know, why are you there? And it, it totally Fs with your head because you have to find that for yourself, you know? And everyone does, or else you really wouldn't be able to stand up on stage. And I think that's a, that's a big 
challenges finding yeah finding out why you should yeah. be that's so overcoming yourself in a way yeah man against man yeah <laughs> exactly just that you know small here yeah 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 um I, i'd love to talk to you a little bit about your about your process i mean i know you so um <laughs> but um for example your process on on a new role that you've never done before and whether it's contemporary music or what maybe just walk can you walk us through a little bit of those okay. those yeah. steps um, well so usually i um You know, I buy the score, I read through it, I check if it's a role that is kind of unusual or, or that I've never heard of or that is not widely available on recordings. I, I, I mean, in any case, I always just check the score in case there's some surprises, literally technical challenges that I think for whatever reason I wouldn't be able to do. So just quickly, literally going through the score, just checking this kind of thing. I mean, this does not take a lot of time. And then getting recordings and kind of falling in love with it through that. And then of course the very slow learning process. So learning it first alone at the piano and then getting doing going through with a coach. And the first I'd say layer of the coach is basically the coach being like see, 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 see. No, that's you know, so this is very yeah. painful. Yeah. And uh, annoying for everyone. And also um I usually can't sing it well at that point because all my energy is going into just the words and the rhythms and the pitches. So yeah. this is like a messy, messy, messy couple weeks. And then it starts obviously to get better. And I listen to all those coachings and then really with the, te like the text, just saying it, I really try not to sing so much anymore because mm -hmm. I can really scrap my voice by repeatedly practicing. And I think it's just as good to like in your head, visualize what you're doing, like singing wise, breathing wise comes a bit later, but what you're doing and then just do that, save your voice. Yeah. And then, um, and then comes the final finishing coachings and work with also my teacher on yeah. things that are breaking it down just with her and saying, Oh, this jump is hard. And then also breaking it down with her while someone plays and she hears the jump in the heat of the action. Cause anyone can do a nice jump or a nice high note when you isolate it, but then she really need, needs to hear it. And I really need to try it in the heat of the action when I can give all my attention to like what I'm doing and the, the instincts are there for the notes and the words and stuff. So I guess that would be the long version. And then, and then you get to the first rehearsal and yeah. then it's also a next step of the process. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's also huge, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, six to eight weeks. And that's when yeah. you really start to, I uh, feel comfortable if it's a role that's very um, popular or a role that I feel less confident in, I guess this is part of my process, but I have to do a lot of affirmations. Okay. For something that, you know, if it's something that I, I feel is my wheelhouse, uh, maybe something either in French or English or something that, I don't know, maybe Mozart or something that I've, I've done before that I feel really comfortable in. I don't need mm -hmm. to do that. If it's something that's new or different or something that I've actually heard people say either to my face or behind my back, like that's not a part for you. But I, you know, I, I thought it was. There's a lot of um, mental work that goes in, like a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. Wow. And, you know, if you really put it in the work and just like, I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of faith. So my natural uh, reaction would be like, I don't think I can really do this. Maybe I should just leave and it's not too late for them to find someone else. I mean, this happens to me often and I know it well enough now that I'm like, okay, or you could literally just write affirmations and, you know, be the Vancouver hippie that you are in your heart <laughs> and just say them out loud every day and, or read them in your head every day. And, you know, that actually really works. I'm amazed at how, how well it works. That's so, amazing. So, I yeah. never knew this about you. Yeah, yeah, I find it very, you know, I find certain parts or certain, depending, yeah. maybe it's the location that's have more high pressure, the role is more high pressure, but yeah. a lot of times when I have to do a lot of, um, of mental, yeah. And um, with, a, with something like, I mean, I'm sure this varies, but with something like a new role, do you come to the first rehearsal with kind of 
clear dramatic ideas or do you know no nothing do you like come, come quite clean yeah, I don't want to I don't want to do that super not because first of all as you know I <laughs> I'm going to talk a lot about Jodie Comer tonight apparently yes, but, please. You know, but when when she, when I saw that I was like that that's it that's it I just knew that that was it and I knew also that whatever the director wanted me to do I could I could work that in you know I felt very I feel very confident always in terms of um dramatically and and acting wise this mm -hmm. I, I don't have a shakable confidence but musically my confidence can be shaken so um but and so dramatically that's why that's why I feel like I I really have um I don't want to come with ideas I don't want to come up with ideas yeah I, I just I will they will happen like also the energy of, of your colleagues can be informs so many things you know the costume you wear the sets how big the theater is like it's so I mean all those things so I don't want to have a <laughs> yeah yeah um so it's so interesting to hear you talk about that um I'm curious it's something I've also just never asked you really as a friend so much but um what are your do you I mean you said earlier that you kind of didn't plan out your career in the way that you wouldn't have expected to be where you are now. Right. Um, has that changed for you? Do you, do you start to think about where you want to go and, or do you have certain goals you really want to, to achieve or artistic things that you really want to explore or are you? I guess I would, there's some directors working out there that are, I've either, that I've either worked with before or that I find intriguing that I would like to to work with that would be a big goal there's also directors that yeah directors that I've worked with before but a certain role that I'd like to try but I would yeah. only feel comfortable with them and um it's yeah I I guess that more I mean of course I would really love also to um sing in some fancy opera houses but I think, I mean, this is always great, right? <laughs> if, I'm, if I do that, then it also is very good for your career and being hired in other fancy opera houses. But the thing that really excites me is actually collaborating with, um, with people that either I love or that I've always loved their work. And I think, oh God, I would give my right eye to, to do something with that. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, so, uh, I think um, I would ask you the question that I love to kind of close up asking, which is um, how and when has music been revolutionary for you? Um, so I looked up revolution for this because this is the only question that you, you told me. And, and also I've seen your show like many, many times. So I know that you ask this question. Um, and I think that I can only, I can only speak about how it's it's revolutionary for me because I don't know how other people are reacting to it, but I just know that if I am, no matter what state I'm in, if I put put something on, um, most of the time things that I know or if, if someone plays something to me, it's like, no matter what my mood is, no matter what I thought I was capable of doing or not capable of doing, no matter how I felt towards someone, like, if I was extremely angry or, you know, really music just, it removes all these things. Like it's a, it makes a dramatic shift inside of me, like more positive towards people, more understanding, even like I, I feel myself listening to something that really touches me. And I'll remember like an old fight I had with someone or, or some really bad wound that I had. And like, I mean, this has to be a, a really specific moment with the music, I think, but you know, it just lets me let it go. And, and, and also just like, if I, if I would see anyone when I listen to music, like you see, I'm, I'm talking, it's usually in headphones. I mean, in live concerts as well, but often I, when I can just have it, like, you know, if I would see someone on the street, I would help them or, you know, I would, if anything happened to them, if they were about to like fall off a bridge, I feel like I would rescue them. Like I would, you know, I just, it gives me, um, a goodwill towards mankind that I otherwise don't have. So that's how, for me, <laughs> it's <laughs> revolutionary. <laughs> yes, well, absolutely. Um, and 
yeah, it, no, I love that. It's, that's so beautiful. Um, I'm curious when you looked up revolution, what did, what, like what stuck? So there you? was obviously the, the wartime revolutions. It said a dramatic change in attitude, operation, or there was another word that I was too lazy to write down. I also wrote guts and no filter. So I think that was a comment on it. <laughs> um, music goes straight to your guts. Yeah, yeah. Words can be very impactful, novels and pamphlets and ideas, but they're still going through a filter. Yeah. Your language filter, but music just skips all that. And I mean, yeah. A dramatic in, in attitude, that's. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show and um, for sharing some of your thoughts and some of your story with all of us. It was oh, really, thank really. You for asking me. It was really lovely to talk to you. Lovely to have you. Um, and for those of you who tuned in, make sure you check out Mireille's playlist that she curated, especially for today. Um, and it's attached underneath the episode, as well as a link to her discography as well. So make sure you check that out. Um, it's basically your dream playlist of early music. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've already been enjoying it all day. <laughs> um, and otherwise, I'll see you all next week. And thank you again so much, Mireille. So good to have you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Bye. Bye.